Ellen Hildebrand is the author of 29 novels, including The Five Star Weekend, which came out in June of this year. She is a proud 1991 graduate of Johns Hopkins University, where she majored in writing seminars. In her senior year at Hopkins, Ellen had her first short story, Misdirection, accepted for publication in Seventeen magazine. After a short stint working in publishing and teaching in New York City, she moved to Nantucket permanently in 1994. She attended the University of Iowa Writers' Workshop and earned her MFA in 1998 and published her first novel, The Beach Club, in the summer of 2000. Her 2019 novel, Summer of 69, was her first novel to debut at number one on the New York Times bestseller list. She is the mother of three children and loves riding the Peloton, cooking, and going to the beach. She will retire with her Summer of 2024 book and plans on becoming a book influencer. Ellen recently started a podcast called Books, the Beach, and Beyond with Tim Talks Books. It's a fantastic podcast. This conversation today with Ellen is a major pinch me moment, so I hope you enjoy our conversation. Happy listening. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's episode of the Professional Book Nerds podcast sponsored by Overdrive. Today, we have a very special guest, Ellen Hildebrand. Welcome, Ellen. Thank you, Emma. It's so wonderful to be here. I am so excited to have you. This is a little bit of a pinch me moment, if I'm honest with you. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my goodness. So you just released your 29th book in June of this year. Um, I am going to ask you about that. And so I wanted to start by having you tell our listeners a little bit about the five-star weekend. Okay. So the five-star weekend um, is sort of a concept novel. And the concept is that um, my main character, Hollis Shaw, is a uh, sort of famous internet food blogger and her husband dies. And she's thrown into, I mean, sadness and grief. And um, in her, as she's sort of wallowing and poking around the internet, she finds an article about another woman who lost her husband, who invited one friend from each part of her life for a special weekend and how that helped her lift her out of her funk, being surrounded by um, friends that sort of define, like her life story and friends. And so I thought this was such a great idea. Um, so Hollis invites her best friend from growing up. Um, she grew up on Nantucket and then moved away and now is back as a summer person. So her best friend from growing up who still lives on Nantucket, her best friend from college, her best friend from raising her children in Wellesley, Massachusetts. And then her fourth friend, which is supposed to be a friend from later in life is a woman who subscribes to her food blog, whom she's never actually met in person. Now, this is such a cool idea to sort of revisit all of the people that influenced you from different stages of your life. Can you tell the listeners a little bit where the idea for this five-star weekend came from? Yes. So I have a writer friend, uh, a fairly well-known writer friend who came to Nantucket. She was attending a five-star weekend. In her case, um, her the friend that organized it was very sick. She had uh, stage four cancer. And while she was still feeling good, she wanted to gather the people who had been important to her over the course of her life and bring them all to Nantucket for the weekend. And so um, this writer reached out to me and said, I'm here for the weekend. Can we meet for a drink? And we met for a drink and it was in 2020. So it was a socially distanced drink. But she told me about um, the premise of this weekend. And I said, oh my gosh, that's a novel. And, and she didn't know any of the other women. And, and she was sort of describing them. And there was like a little bit of, I think, static or friction between a couple of them. And um, I said, oh my gosh, that's a novel. And she said, well, it's an Ellen Hildebrand novel. And then she told me the parts I could use and the parts I couldn't use. Um, initially, when I set out, I was going to use it the exact same premise, have a woman who was sick and, and knew that her time was coming to an end and have her do it. But then I thought, you know what, that's too sad. I'm going to change it. And so I just had it where her husband had died. So yes, different uh, grief, but uh, certainly a great Ellen Hildebrand book. I'm wondering how long the writing process took for this book. You seem like you have a very well-oiled machine sort of system with your with your books, sort of doing one to two a year, depending on the year. Yes. So this book, um, I 
a couple of years ago, I guess 2020 was the last year that I did two books a year. Um, however, in 2024, I will have two books, but I took a couple of years off doing the two books a year. So this book was, I started in January of 2022 and handed it in, you know, I work all year and then I handed it in around Halloween and it goes to my editor, Judy Klein at Little Brown. And then Judy reads it and, you know, we t- talk on the phone and go over all of the points, all the things she wants me to change. Then I actually move out of my house. I go to, I take an, a rent an apartment in Boston, like a little tiny apartment in charming Beacon Hill. And I live in the city for six to eight weeks and uh, I do my revisions. And I, I, it's sort of like Emily Dickinson, like I, it gets dark in Boston at three o'clock in the afternoon in November. And uh, so I light my candles and it's very cozy and I have my tea and I work, work, work. And I really don't, I try not to see other people. Like I just, I'm very focused on the re- the revising process. And then I will turn it back to Judy sometime early December and then we are on our way. That sounds wonderful. I love that you have a nice cozy setup, but that you also stay pretty consistent in your methods for each book. Yes, I have to. Yeah. Do you have any traditions that you celebrate ahead of every book release? <laughs> um, no, I'm just trying to keep my head above water. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. um, I will that. I mean, I'm presently writing my last uh, Nantucket summer novel that will be released next year. Um, well, I, when I finish that one or ahead of that one, I mean, I'm always, you know, what you have to understand is that it's different from when I started out. When I started out, really, the publishing process was all in the publisher's hands. And these days, um, you know, publishing a book is really half in the author's hands because of social media. And I do all my social media by myself. You know, it's all very organic. Um, And so, you know, leading up to the release of any book, I'm just always trying to gear up my readers, um, you know, giving them little teases of what's to come and getting them excited and releasing my tour schedule and, you know, showing little bits and pieces of Nantucket as Nantucket sort of enters the summer season because um, Nantucket is always a main character in my novels and people want to see it. And so it's it's the social media gear up that um, I think is the most important. Um, but I, I don't have any rituals. I really hope that when I when I fin- finally finish my last Nantucket summer novel that I will have some champagne and some caviar. That's my plan. That sounds like a fantastic plan. Now, like Hollis in the book, I'm curious to know if you think of your own life and you think of those friends that were influential to each stage of your life. I'm curious if you've ever had this sort of setup where your friend groups have sort of co-mingled or if you would consider doing your own five-star weekend with your close friends. I mean, it's so funny because, of course, I've thought of it because, you know, people have asked me. Mm -hmm. Um, It. you know, it wouldn't be impossible, but my, my life has not unfolded like Hollis is like, you know, um, I had a very, very, very close friend in high school. I I don't even know where she is right now. Um, I have, there's another really close friend of mine from high school that I am in touch with that I saw over Chris, like this past Christmas. Um, so I would probably invite her. And then I, my friends from college, like I have two best friends and I couldn't pick between them. Like I would have to invite them. (laughs) Um, and then because, because I've lived on Nantucket for 30 years, um, my friends from sort of raising my kid that era. And then my, my, I have a new ish set of friends, um, from, from middle age who I've only been friends with for four or five years. So those people all know each other. So I would bring them together and I do bring them together pretty regularly. But so I don't really have a, um, a Hollis type situation. Um, but I, I, I'm excited to hear about people who, who do, go through this social experiment and do hold this weekend. Yeah. It's interesting that um, perhaps the friend groups aren't quite so clear cut as they are with Hollis, but definitely interesting to think about who you would bring uh, from the different stages of life. Yeah, totally. So I have a a similar question um, for that though, is I'm wondering if you had to invite a sort of an author themed five-star weekend, if there are Ah. authors that would be on your short list. Oh, absolutely. So, I mean, I'd obviously have some authors I know and some authors I don't know. I am a huge fan of, uh, I think the best person writing in the English language today is Maggie O'Farrell. 
And um, I don't know her. <laughs> I don't know if she would come. But uh, of all living writers today, I would probably, she would be very high on my list. Um, I also like just personal friends. Like I love Meg Mitchell more. Dorothea Benton Frank was a dear, dear friend of mine. So if I could bring her back from the beyond, I would bring, I would bring Dottie back. Um, Adriana Trigiani, always fun at any kind of gathering. So I think she would probably round us out. That's an incredible author lineup right there. Readers would love to hear about that if that ever were to happen. Hollis invites one of her blog readers uh, to her five-star weekend, one that she's never met in real life, but has corresponded through the site and then through texting. Uh, You said this a little bit in the context of the author space, but would you ever invite someone to your home that you've never met? It seems a little bit far-fetched, but also certainly fun for the book. I'm trying to think. I, 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 this is what I'll say. I have met people who started out as readers, whom I did not know, who now, over the course of my career, have become treasured friends. You know, there are women who, and I don't know how they got through the, it's almost like getting through the net. Like they just, I just, I don't know how it happens, but certain, I just connect with certain readers and they have become friends. I have their cell phone numbers. We text all the time and they just started out purely as readers and it has been quite magical and wonderful. And I hope that once I retire, that I have more time to like foster friendships with people that I don't, that I don't know. Um, There are people like in my social media who will comment on every single one of my posts. So I feel, and some of them I follow on on Instagram or whatever. And so I feel like I know them, even though we've never met. So I can sort of see how Hollis would be like, you know, this woman always responds and like, she's the one I look forward to hearing from. And, you know, she has her act together and, and, and I'd really like to know her. So I think that's where it came from, from Hollis's perspective. Absolutely. There's that familiarity through other means, sort of social media and comments and so on. So I like Hollis, you are an avid cook. Um, your Instagram followers know cringe cooking, you churn your own butter. And I will say that love of cooking is apparent in all of the food descriptions for Hollis. Everything in this book was just mouthwatering. So I'm curious to know what's the best thing you've made recently? What is the best thing I've made recently? Oh my goodness. So recently, very simple. So my daughter, my daughter's picky eater. I've got so many children. She's the youngest. She's a picky eater. Um, and so she sends me TikTok, TikTok recipes. And so she sent me a TikTok recipe for a smash burger taco. And I thought to myself, is this going to work? And so I did make it on my cringe cooking last week. And they were absolutely fantastic. And she wanted me to make it just like they did in the TikTok video. Raw onions, dill pickles, things that I know she doesn't eat. But I made the, I made it exactly like they did, and she she ate every single bite. And um, so for those of you out of here listening, if you see the smash burger taco recipe, it's a winner. It takes no time and costs no money. It's just a tortilla, ground beef, a piece of American cheese, and some pickles and onions and some secret sauce. I mean, it you can probably make it for like three dollars a taco, maybe less. So that was exciting. It sounds fantastic, and almost like it's too easy. But I love that. It was so easy. I could not get over. I was just like, this is going to be like a new Ellen, a new in the rotation because it was just, and it tasted so delicious. I love that. And now um, this might be a little too in the weeds, but I'm curious if any of the recipes or any of the food that you mentioned in the five-star weekend were sort of go-to recipes for you or any family recipes, or if they were just fun to have in the context of the story. Well, so the the dinner that um, Hollis makes on Friday night for her friends is a, well, she does a charcuterie board, and then she does a grilled swordfish, which is a recipe I found in Bon Appetit, I don't know, probably 20 years ago, and I always make it for company. So if I'm having, like, I'm having my friends Chuck and Margie, aka the perfect couple, they're coming over on Sunday night, and I will make the swordfish. So basically, the fish that you get here in Nantucket is caught that very same day, absolutely exquisite. And I'll marinate it in the morning. It's scallions, lime, um, cilantro, brown sugar. You mix it all together. You marinate the fish. You grill the fish. And then you serve it with an avocado, basically avocado and mayonnaise whipped together. So it's like a little avocado whip. 
um, Paula serves a summer squash tart, which was something I was served at a dinner party in March of 22 when I was on St. John made by a woman named Shayla McCabe. It was delicious. And then she does a green salad and baguette, homemade baguettes with black pepper butter. And I do turn my own butter. Um, I was given a butter churn for Christmas a number of years ago and it is so simple and the butter is so delicious that um, really I think it's much easier than people think. Yeah, that sounds fantastic. It was to the point where, so I first read this book, actually, I got an early copy. I was very lucky and I read it on a girl's weekend um, back in the oh, spring fun. and I would like stop everyone. We were sort of on a reading retreat girls weekend and I would read these food descriptions aloud and everyone would just sit there and go like, well, <laughs> that's what we want to do right now. So it's absolutely fantastic. <laughs> You commented on this a little bit earlier, and we know that the book comments on the fickle nature of social media, both through Hollis and her best friend, Drew Ann, and the things that they have going yep. on in this book. How do you feel about having so much of our lives on social media and, and how sort of crucial or, or big a part it's become as your job as an author? Well, I mean, it cuts both ways, just like every single other thing in life. So on the one hand, it is amazing that I can connect with so many people. Whereas like in the first, in my first 10, 12 books, you know, I didn't know how people felt about them. I had to rely on reviews in newspapers, right? Um, and, and then at some point it shifted and I couldn't even tell you when it was, but at some point then when you're able to connect, well, I went, I got on Instagram and 2013. I think it was 2015 or 2016 before I was starting to really connect with my readers that way. Um, and it was amazing because then I can, you know, really reach so many people. Um, and now have this whole entire community and, and, you know, I have, I don't know, 152,000 followers. So if I have a message to get out or something that I want them to know, you know, it's so easy. And then, you know, the bad part is that of course they can <laughs> just tell you exactly what you think. And, and as we've all learned, it's much easier to tell someone what you think of them when you don't have to stand in front of them face to face. And there was a time, I think it was probably during the pandemic or possibly 19 when I was really on a crusade thinking that, you know, people should not be able to say negative things about my books or anybody else's books. And then tag our, put our name on, tag us in it. Cause it's basically akin. I thought at that time, akin to, you know, walking up to Meryl Streep and saying, I hated you in your last movie. Like, would you ever do that? No. So, um, I, I really had a problem with the way like book reviews online were, you know, trashing, not even my book so much as other people's books. And then, you know, sort of flaunting it in front of their face. I have given up that crusade because, um, it, it just, it didn't work out for me. Like, I feel like the the people who review books are going to have to follow their own hearts. And if they want to put up a negative review and tag, that's fine. I don't, I, you know, I've just stopped interfering because that's a whole, the book review, the bookstagram is a whole other business that has nothing to do with me. And I had no place sticking my, my neck out or my head in that business. So my nose in that business. So um, that's sort of what I've learned, but it, it was, you know, it felt like really discouraging and really bad for a while. And then I'm like, you know what, Ellen, just let it go. And, and I've been so much happier. Yeah, that is, in my opinion, such bad form to tag the author in something mean or negative. Absolutely not. But I'm glad that you've been able to sort of not engage with any of that negativity because you do have such a large community of readers who absolutely love you and your books. And hopefully that uh, can give, you know, a little bit more of the time and space instead of the negativity. I know. Like I would, I post a lot of books on my own Instagram. Like I do a lot of, I, I would no sooner put, say anything negative about someone else's book. Can you imagine? No, you that, <laughs> I, I would, I, I would no sooner do it. And so I guess it was like a little bit of a foreign concept, but I am not solely a bookstagrammer. And I know that those people have, have to give their honest opinions. And, um, whereas I would be probably like, if you don't have anything nice to say, just don't, don't give it any press. Um, I do understand that whatever they are in the business of, of, uh, you know, giving their opinions and yeah. So I've just successfully sort of said, you know what, you guys do you. And I'm not even, I'm not even going to worry about it. 
Absolutely. Probably for the best, but it is an interesting community, this sort of book review, bookstagram community. I tend to focus on the positive and hopefully a lot of other people do as well. Yeah. So you recently went on a fantastic book tour across the country. How was that? Oh, it was amazing. I mean, it's exhausting because of course it's a different hotel every single night and you know, absolutely no time to yourself. I mean, you're, you know, before you, you know, you get to the hotel, you check in, you figure out where you're going to eat and then you go to your event, you get dressed, whatever. So it's a lot. Um, it's exhausting. I do. I think I did 15 events in 12 days. Um, and I went everywhere from, you know, um, Boston to Houston, Texas. So it was a lot, it was a lot of travel. Um, but I love meeting my readers in person. Um, it's super exciting. I love seeing the bookstore owners. You know, I, I have relationships with some stores that I, you know, where it was like my 13th visit in 13th summer in a row and think about how amazing that is. And their friend, you know, book owners that I would consider bookstore owners and who I'm, whom I would consider friends. And so it's always good to do it. So I will do my last summer tour next mm-hmm. June. That sounds exhausting, but very fun. Is there a part of tour that was most memorable for you this year? Um, the answer to that, I did a 500 person event in Manasquan, New Jersey, and it's one of my favorite events of the tour. Um, cause I am such good friends with the people who host it and it's at the part place called the Parker house on the Jersey shore at the beach. And the color was pink and everyone wore pink and there was, there were hors d'oeuvres and you know, there was a special drink and it was really, really, I think that was my favorite event. It was long. It was four hours long. You know, I signed for four straight hours, but it was, it was really fun to see everybody. And I think everybody had a really good time. It was more than just the signing, you know, it was more like a party. Absolutely. Now I do have a little bit of a self-indulgent caveat question to that. I'm yeah. wondering if you'll be coming back to Cleveland, weather permitting for your summer <laughs> tour next year. <laughs> yes. To all my Cleveland fans, I am very sorry. I got stuck at the Raleigh. I was at the Raleigh airport for 12 hours and tried every which way to get there were thunderstorms every which way to get to Cleveland mm-hmm. and it just could not be done. And then the, the, at the last, final hour, like I took a shower at the airport, like I was all set to like do what it was going to take to get to Cleveland. And then, uh, the last, you know, I couldn't, I could not get there. Um, so yes, Cleveland is going to be on my list. I'm also doing a an event in Cleveland in September and I'll have to circle back with you cause I'm not exactly sure what the details are, but it is a, it is in the, I don't know if it's private or what, but I will be back in Cleveland in September. But I'm coming back to do an event for the public. It, it will either be this fall or it will be next spring. Fantastic. Uh, that's a little bit self-indulgent for me. Overdrive and the professional book nerds are based in Cleveland. So we want to make sure ah, we get back here before yes, the uh, retirement. <laughs> I will be there. I promise, Emma. Wonderful. Now that speaking of, you said that there's sort of the natural end to your material for the Nantucket stories. And so that'll prompt your upcoming retirement from sort of those series and that sort of book a year pace. I'm wondering what you're most looking forward to sort of once all of that's behind you. Well, I am going to really look forward to just reading and I will be writing. So one of the things, when I say I'm retiring from the Nantucket Summer Books, I, I have signed a two-book deal uh, to write two novels set at boarding, a New England boarding school with my daughter, Shelby. So Shelby and I, um, we're actually already halfway through the first book. So Shelby and I are writing two books. Um, and it's going to be a little bit like the Hotel Nantucket because it's going to be tiered told from different points of view. Starting with, you know, I'm writing the head of school, I'm writing the teachers, and I'm writing the parents. And Shelby is writing the the four kids that we're following through their junior and senior year. Um, And so I'm really looking forward to working on that with her. And we have such good ideas. And and then I'm going to write, I will write probably another novel. What I really look forward to is being able to do it at my own pace. Mm -hmm. And work on it when I want to, because I want to, not because I have to. And, and, and you know, other than that, I will be, you know, my life will be consumed with just reading. And 
I started my own podcast called Book Speech and Beyond um, with my work husband, Tim Ehrenberg, Tim Talks Books. And, you know, we have interviewed, so far we've interviewed Taylor Jenkins Reid, Kristen Hanna, um, who else did we have? Jenna Bush Hager. We had Jake Tapper, Sonny Hostin, Jody Pico. So we've had a lot of like really big writers on. And so I'm excited to go into season two of that. Yeah, absolutely. And so that is very conveniently my next question on the list is that you have started this new podcast. How has it been to sort of flex your creativity in a different medium? You know, I thought I would be too busy to even start it. And Tim was like, we need to do it this year. We need to do it this year. And I thought, okay. I like, he dragged me along. I have absolutely loved it. It is so much fun to be able to talk to people who have, you know, similar career trajectories to my own, you know, people who are like, have been doing it a long time you know, who sort of know inside baseball is what it's like to be, you know, a, a writer and bringing on a lot of, you know, writing a lot of books. I, it has been so awesome. I'm, I'm super excited. I'm, we're interviewing Colleen Hoover in a couple of weeks and I can't wait to talk to her. I'm very excited. She, I, she was my first, you know, when I started asking people to do it, she was the first person I emailed and I said, I know you're not doing anything because she stopped doing a lot of uh, publicity and marketing. I said, I know you're not doing anything. I said, but I want you to do my podcast. And she was like, anything for you, Ellen? I'm like, okay, thank you. Um, she's really a doll. So I'm very much looking forward to um, talking to Colleen. Yeah, the your podcast has been fantastic. I have listened to the episodes you've had so far, and it's been such a fun insight into not only you and your career and Tim, and also that peek behind the curtain sort of into publishing. And then obviously these uh, big name authors, I really enjoyed your conversation with Taylor Jenkins Reid. That was just so fun to hear sort of all of the ins and outs, you know, what to do when you see people, parenthood and all of these other things. So I'm happy to see more to come from you on the podcast. Yeah, it's it, it's been really fun because like there are a lot of topics that I can't really talk to anybody else about because they might not understand. So like I talked to Kristen Hanna about blurbs. She, you know, I get sent every beach book that comes out. Kristen Hanna gets sent every World War II book that comes <laughs> out. Yeah. Basically send me anything else. Um, and that's sort of how I am too. And uh, then I talked to Sunny Hostin about what to do about Goodreads reviews and like, do you read them? Amazon reviews, like. And so that was really, really interesting. Um, but there are fun, you know, topics, writer topics that I don't, I can't talk to anybody else about. So um, that has been probably the most gratifying part. Absolutely. And how do you prepare for your podcast conversations? What's that like? So I let Tim do all of it. Although I will say like in the in the instances of Jake Tapper and Sunny Hostin, I read their, their book. So Sunny had a book out called uh, Summer in Sag Harbor. I read that, which I loved. And then Jake had a book out called All the Demons Are Here. Mm -hmm. So those were two that I read specifically. This isn't, the one thing about my podcast, which I have to make clear, is that it isn't a buy the book. It isn't a buy the book podcast. So it's not like we're we're talking to this author about this book. I'm very specifically going after big, big authors so that you've read, so that you've already read all their books. That's Mm -hmm. sort of my intention. Right. So you've already read Taylor, Taylor Jenkins Reid's books and you've already read Kristen Hanna's books. So you don't, you wouldn't have to do any homework for the podcast, I guess, is what I'm saying. And um, so that was really my intention with this. I, I do have a lot of publicists calling me saying, oh, you know, I have a client with it. And I'm like, you know what? That is probably somebody else's podcast, but I'm only doing, you know, people like th- that are huge that you would already know. Absolutely. So I, I think that that's such a good point. There's not any maybe risk of like spoilers or having it just be tied to one book. You can really sort of get right. into a lot more topics. Right. Like we talked, I talked to Jody, when we talked to Jody Pico, we talked about book banding, of course, but we also talked about, you know, the structure and the twit, like her unbelievable twists and how she comes up with it, like just sort of process mm-hmm. and general. Yeah. General process. That. And it's been so much fun. Yeah. That that's certainly like that fun and that 
just excitement that you both have that comes across in the podcast. So again, I'm super eager to hear what else you've got for season one. Yeah, but Tim, I have to say, Tim does all the prep. So he comes up with the questions and then he sits down with me and he says, okay, what are we going to talk to Jake Tapper about? And we go over everything and then he types it all out and highlights my part. Because <laughs> I said to him, if I'm doing this, I, you need to make it as easy for me as possible because I just don't have time. So Absolutely. he has done the majority, yeah. majority of the prep. I love that. Now, this next question might be like asking if you have a favorite child, but I'm wondering if there is a book that you've written that you're particularly fond of. I love The Blue Bistro. It, mm-hmm. um, it was my fourth novel set at a restaurant. I've never worked in a restaurant. And so it was, um, you know, I did a lot of research and it was, it, you know, I'm such a foodie. So it was so satisfying for me to write this book. And I, and a, a lot of people say, and also has this great love triangle in it. Um, complicated. It, it was, it was really, I love the blue bistro. Not my more, more recent novels. I would say 28 summers is my favorite, which is a reboot of, same time next year and is a love story. And really, I just felt very emotionally attached to those characters. Yeah, of course. And now I'm wondering if you had a reader who is looking to start reading the Ellen Hildebrand backlist, would those be the two you would recommend they start with? Or what would the no, approach be? I, they wouldn't. I would recommend they start with The Perfect Couple. Um, I think The Perfect Couple is my most user-friendly. That's being made into a Netflix series. Um, with Nicole Kidman and Liam Schreiber and Dakota Fanning and this just amazing cast. Um, the Perfect Couple is a murder mystery-ish. It's set at a very fancy wedding. The maid of honor is found floating in the harbor the day of the wedding, and then we have to figure out what happened. And um, that would be the one. That's the one I always tell people to start with. That's such a great one. And I'm so excited that it is going to be the Netflix limited series. That's so exciting to finally see your characters on the screen. I know. I'm super excited. We have to wait until everybody, all the strikes are over. So I'm very being very patient. Yes, absolutely. Now you have mentioned that you get asked to blurb a ton of books, like constantly asked to look at the beach books and give them a quote, but I want to flip that a little bit and ask if there is a one that's the coolest blurb that you have ever received for any of your books. If there's one that's sort oh of my very gosh. memorable. Yeah. It's so funny. Cause I've, I, we don't, for whatever reason, my publisher has not asked people for blurbs in a long time, but um, way back when, when I think it was the Blue Bistro came out, James Patterson gave me a quote and I almost fell through the floor. I was so excited. I couldn't believe it. And, um, so that was really, I don't think I'm not, the, the Blue Bistro didn't sell very well. So I'm not sure it actually did any good, but I was excited, um, to have James Patterson and now we're friends. I mean, we have the same publisher now and, uh, and he and his wife are, are personal friends of mine. So that that was really a fun moment. There was also a time when when I switched publishers in 2007 and my novel Barefoot came out, Eleanor Lipman, who's a writer I loved, she gave me a beautiful quote for Barefoot. And so that that was great. I love that. How cool. And yeah, what about um, just how fun that you are friends now with some of those folks that started out sort of as blurbs? Yeah. Now, can you talk about Swan Song at all? Um, I can talk about Swan Song. Swan Song is my novel that's coming out in 2024. At the beginning, there is a fire and a woman goes missing. And it's sort of a stranger. The plot is stranger comes to town. There's a couple that comes to town. They buy this house. That's the house that ends up catching on fire. They hire a personal assistant. That's the woman that ends up going up missing. And these three people become entwined you know, we start at the end, like basically, so the prologue is the fire. And then we go back to the beginning of the summer to figure out how we got, how we got there. Um, They become entwined with characters that people who have read my books will already know the chief is in it. It's called Swan Song because it's the chief's last summer. He's retiring. He has had health issues, heart issues, and he's retiring. And um, it's his, this summer is his Swan Song. It's his last summer before he retires. And of course, at the very end of the summer, just three days before he's about to retire, 
there is this sort of double case of the fire and the, and the missing woman. And he is personally involved because he knows the couple that own the house and he's become friends with them. And his daughter, Casey, who is a NICU nurse, who's back on Nantucket for the summer. She has become best friends with the woman who's missing. So it, it is, um, it's like a lot of drama and a lot of, um, fun summer stuff, like parties, summer parties, you know, gossip, romance, like all the things. And and then also the added element of we're trying to figure out what happened um, with this couple's house and this girl. So it should be, if I can pull it off, Emma, it should be very satisfying um, and check all the boxes for the Ellen Hildebrand's last novel. Oh, that sounds fantastic. And I will say my friend uh, that works here at Overdrive, Kate, she is like your biggest champion anyone I've ever met. And she was curious. She was asking me the other day, she's like, do you think the police chief will be in the book? Can you ask? So I know <laughs> she'll be thrilled that he's going to yes. feature in Swan Song. He is, of course, of course, my chief, my police chief, it's, it's, it's his Swan Song. So he's in it. It's fantastic. Now, just to wrap us up, I wanted to ask a couple of fun questions. Uh, what are you reading right now? Right now, I am reading a book called Hope by Andrew Ritker. Um, it just, I think, was just released a week or two ago, and I am absolutely, absolutely loving it. I don't read a lot of uh, male authors. In the course of my year, I will read like 50 or 60 books, and I would say 10% of them are male authors. But this one happens to be a male author, and I am really enjoying it, Hope. Um, other books that I've read recently that I've really, really loved – um, yellow face. I loved, I loved, um, uh, you are here by Karen Greenberg. I loved, what else did I just finish? Oh, everything is fine by Cecilia Rabbit. Oh my gosh. Loved, loved, loved it. And if you look at my Instagram, you will see all of my recommendations. I love that. And I'm curious if you have a most anticipated book for the rest of the year. You know, that's a really good question. I, I have a stack like you would not believe. Um, as far as holiday goes, I have a novel upstairs by Becca Freeman called The Christmas Orphans Club that I'm going to read when it, the, weather, <laughs> the weather cools down a little bit. But um, it's her first novel, and I'm super excited for her. Um, also on my pile, The Guest by Emma Klein is on my pile. Um, there's a book of essays by Helen Ellis, who I love. That's in my pile. And I want to read the auto the autobiography or the biography of X. Um, that's on my list. So I'm I have a lot, a lot teed up. Yeah, some incredible releases. That's always the way, isn't it? When you you're a lover of books, the to be read pile is long. <laughs> so I'm wondering if there's anything else you want to let our listeners know about. Where can they find you most? I know you mentioned Instagram. Yeah. Instagram is always best, I think for, um, and then my podcast books, Beach, let's see, it's called books, beach and beyond. And we drop new episodes every other Wednesday. And yeah, my Instagram page is definitely where to find me. I want to thank all the librarians listening because my love for reading started at the Arrowhead library when I was in first grade. Um, I can remember in second grade, I went to my library, Mrs. Hirsch, who then became a family friend. And I said to her, I have read every book in the library. I'm seven, right? And <laughs> so uh, she ended up ordering the entire catalog of Nancy Drew, the entire series. And I, you know, spent, I guess, third grade working my way through all the Nancy Drews. But my love for reading was fostered um, at my elementary school library. And every summer, like, I, I grew up outside Philadelphia, and every summer, you know, on Wednesdays or Mondays, I can't remember what day, my mother would take us to the public library and we would go and get books for our summer reading. And I can remember sitting in the car with a huge stack of books um, next to me. I read, I don't know, Beverly Clear. I read a lot of like 50s and 60s <laughs> romances that my mom had read as a teenager. She was always recommending books. That's wonderful to hear. Our libraries are so important. And so it's lovely that you've got fond memories of your local libraries as well. Ellen, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. I know you've had a very busy summer, so this is truly a pinch me moment. I'm so happy we got the chance to chat about the Five Star Weekend. Thank you, Emma. Thank you so much. 
Readers can sample and borrow the titles mentioned in today's episode on Overdrive.com or in Libby. Our library friends can purchase these titles in Marketplace. Professional Book Nerds is proud to be an Evergreen Podcast signature program. To learn about other Evergreen podcasts, visit evergreenpodcast.com. Our podcast is produced, recorded, and edited by Emma Dwyer and Joe Skelly and presented by Overdrive. To learn more, visit professionalbooknerds.com.